My name is Jan Welch, and welcome to part two of episode 20 of the Then and Now Blading podcast featuring Jeremy Baytal. If you didn't catch part one, I have a link up above in one of these corners to that interview where we talk about his history in the sport, his origin, his skating. We talk about his work with Rattel, Caspa. We will continue talking about his art and his life within the sport in part two. I hope you enjoy it. If you do, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe to this channel. If you haven't already, hit the bell icon to be notified of all new uploads. I have links to my social media in the description below. And if you want to support this channel, I have a link to my Patreon page, as well as a donation page in the link below as well. Let's get started with part two of episode 20 of the Then and Now Blading podcast featuring Jeremy Baytal. What artists other than Chris Peel in, in rollerblading do you like? Is there any like ones you've been following? New artists, older ones? My favorite shirt ever, or my first favorite shirt. It's somewhere in here too, but I won't leave again. But um, uh, was the Senate two-headed bird thing? I um. I can't remember what it was. I always thought Arlo did it, but I don't know if he did. But um, I really have always appreciated Arlo's uh, work in the industry. But as far as, um, I don't know, nobody's really been a face for art um, in skating. Maybe Arlo, myself, and Peel. I'm not sure if anybody else has really gotten attention or if they, um, or if they even skate or if they're friends of somebody or if they're just kind of corporate guys, I'm not sure. I don't really know who does, uh, who does anything. Yeah, um, I got, you know, a few of those oh, guys, it, like I did the interviews with them, Big Wheel Blading, like Adam Manoa and Chris Piazic. Oh yeah, th those guys are both nuts. Yeah, that's yeah. Not, they're all. Yeah. And those guys are procreate guys, you know, they do. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I, I forgot about TF. Uh, his stuff's been great for years. Um, yeah, Manoa's, I just learned about them uh, from Edwards because he was working with Edwards to do uh, some of the birth stuff that Chris was trying to do for um, uh, kids skates, but I I'm not sure what's, what's going on with that right now. But man, his stuff is insane. It's so good. Uh, yeah, he's like lucas studios level cartoon illustrator man he's, he's like yeah him and chris both teach college level art classes too adam has on his site you can see like his students work there's lots of cool stuff from just like students do that's one I, thing i was trying to do with big world blading is to spotlight some of those artists in the artist series yeah yeah oh. because yeah that's you know they don't get the attention they deserve in my opinion yeah and we kind of need that um, as far as skating culture goes, because again, we don't, we seem to not have a history or a culture that continues, you know, everybody's too focused on pants or something. I don't know, man. It's just, I don't, I don't, I don't know. It's so pants weird. just keep coming back. The conversation that won't, that won't end. Yeah. So weird. Um, but uh, yeah, I've, I've never been in really in a, seen an argument about pants anywhere outside of rollerblading. It's uh, very isolating. Um, but uh, yeah, um, fuck, what is his name? I am blanking right now. I've been doing the 16 hour days for the past four days. So my brain's not very sharp. Um, Adam um, that did low life and was doing vicious stuff. Adam Namara. Oh, dude. I love that, dude. Adam Namara. John Elliott and I used to own a vintage clothing shop in San Diego called Bedouin. And we also did art shows every month. And we did a rollerblading art show. You showed at it. Yeah. Adam showed at it. Chris Peel showed at it. Sayer Danforth, Eric Burke, and Drew Backrack. Yeah, yeah. Drew was in there. Yeah. That was a, that was a, that was a wild trip, man. <laughs> that was, uh, yeah. The photo of us on John's couch. Dude, <laughs> so bad. So bad. But yeah, that was a really cool, that it. was a really cool event, you know, doing that. Yeah, it was. There like should how, be more stuff like that. How many art shows have you been a part of throughout your career? Like, oh, Jesus. 
um, I don't know. Between group, I've been obviously more group shows. It's a lot easier because you don't have to do uh, well as much work. Um, but maybe like fifty, something like that. But a lot more group shows than solo shows. I've only done a handful of solo shows because those um, doing one in particular literally drove me to a mental breakdown. So it's not. Um, they're not the easiest things to do. So a group show is cool. I can just paint and uh, put it up and maybe it'll, it'll sell, but doing an actual show, man, it's, it's uh, really, really stressful unless you have the means to do the show and, um, or you maybe have a template with your work, but I don't. So it's, it's very stressful uh, to do a solo show. So, um, but I've been in a lot of shows, but yeah, man, I, I don't know. Somebody should try to organize that of uh, all the artists that there are in skating and that people don't even know. Um, uh, so, for example, um, on China's Wheel, I, I heard about this. I, I've been in the industry long enough that you know you learn not to read the fucking comment section. Um, it's like I'm going to drive to Michigan and punch that kid in the fit, you know. Um, so. Uh, somebody somebody made a comment of um that the china wheel was a ripoff of some other wheel that just came out because of the font i'm like dude i've used that font multiple times on wheels it's like a graffiti bubble font it's really simple and um yeah some kid in the comment section i guess or some some person in the comment section said something about that and um it's like we don't even know who our own people are you know, and it's just, uh, you know, every, it, and it's outside of skating too. It, you know, there, there's always those people that want to be the smartest person in the room and they need that validation because they're that kind of person. But um, yeah, we don't even know our own guys. You know, I don't even know if anybody knows who, who Numera is. I don't, I don't know if anybody knows who Backrack is. Well, there are people our age that know this stuff. Um, and there are some people that have, that, have learned it but man a lot of people because you have a lot of people coming back into skating which is really cool but um i don't know man if you don't know i, I don't know why you would nobody hates rollerbladers more than rollerbladers man that's a hundred percent true and uh it's it's crazy and um so i don't know i think we need more organization with uh or events to showcase artists um I'm actually working on something like that right now, but I'm still waiting for the person to get back to me. But um, just something specifically that I want to work with different artists. Um, and uh, it, the idea is to do that and then um, be able to support people that want to get into skating that maybe don't have the means to do it. So that's something that's coming up. Uh, cool. Hopefully here so um yeah it, it uh i'll let you know and um yeah and i'll i'll, I'll release Ho hopefully everything works out i just did the numbers with uh the person that i'd be working with for manufacturing recently and we figured out a way to make it work so um it'd definitely be a cool thing i'll let you know about it yeah keep me posted i definitely yeah. will help promote it i think that you know doing an art show with inline skating artists like we did with you guys back in i don't even know the date of that it had to be mid 2000s or no it was late it was late 2000s because it was probably 2010 because that's when we had the shop like from 2010 to 2012 okay okay yeah, that's when i was yeah that's when i yeah 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 that's because i look at that picture and i look like a fucking zombie that's when i was like sick and I that was my first time on a plane since I like got sick. Actually, that the art show thing and a couple other things. And I was, yeah, that's that's when it was, probably 2010. I think that would be a cool summer event, like for John Julio to do a blading cup at the dem shop that they have now. You know, in downtown Santa Ana, they could get all the blading People artists up it, on man. the walls. Yeah, It'd be pretty cool. Somebody, somebody needs to do it, but you know people think about here's the the logistics of it can be difficult because you have to have <coughs> um, 
you have to get the art there you know like that can cost maybe a hundred dollars a piece you know um then hang the stuff and then negotiate if they're going to be percentages um so that's that's the hard thing about galleries and i can tell you man most art galleries they're like coke fronts you know for the, for the most part or for anyway the ones i've shown in but um there, there's always some kind of front going on and um uh but they're taking their percentage and things like that so there's you know i don't know it, anyway it, it, it could be difficult to do but if somebody wanted to do it it's definitely possible and well we made it happen so yeah, totally. to make it happen yeah absolutely well there you go absolutely yeah right it's already happened you know um but there are no events like that there's nothing really featured outside of um uh like for example daniel kinney bitter cold showdown he'd have me do the shirt and he would promote you know my name along with the shirt so there's a piece that's promoted but nobody's really put different artists in line with each other um and you know we need more stuff like that because a lot of people don't even know their own history and um of what the, the industry is and it, i think that's uh made a hole in, in the potential culture that we could have there, there's a culture there but it's more of just a history it's not you know there's nothing really there from it i think one thing i found interesting is you know i've always tried to help promote people and like with the big wool blading series you know under artist series i contact a lot of artists like you know just to help promote them in the sport and you know probably like 75 percent of them don't ever get you know they're like oh i'm interested but then they never respond you know so it's yeah. like you know it's yeah. not like a like a lot of work it's just like a short little interview type of thing you know and hey man how long is it <laughs> fucking sit down man you know um that's the thing with uh you know sometimes the schedules are bad but i don't know i don't know if anybody really i don't know i don't know yeah it, it's i can definitely i know some people that i've you know other artists that i've worked with or whatever they definitely love jumping in front of the camera for sure but they're more really in it to be famous than they are to be you know artists um once they realize what it's really like they people dip out pretty quick what's your goal with art what's what's kept you doing your art for so long like uh that i can put ideas out into the world and um you know it's the thing i wanted to do as a kid and everybody told me i couldn't and uh you know here we are um but uh I don't know, just to put ideas out there and kind of um, one concept I really like is the idea of capturing time in a way of uh, the time that I spent doing something, it's there. And, um, you know, say a tsunami hits and wipes out, you know, all of America, uh, my paintings are built to maybe potentially survive that. And, um, the next culture built from those ruins could be based off of something that I just drew up one day. I think that's kind of funny. <laughs> that is funny. And that would be pretty cool. <laughs> the culture came out of your art. Yeah, it's weird, man. Like uh, that goat, uh, I have one painting where it's like a goat headed woman with in front of a rainbow. That thing's been stolen so many times and uh, it'd be funny to, uh, or even that priest painting, it'd be funny if people found those and like, oh, this is what society was like before we got here. You know, it's kind of. For your actual paintings, what medium do you use for that? And would you paint uh, a canvas or something else? I prefer to paint on birch panels because um, I like to go in and sand some areas out. So I'll paint one color down and put a color over top of it and then sand it so you'll get this weird color effect um but that's on some things but i don't know you've seen my work and um i'll do the really illustrative paintings and then sometimes i need to take a break from that and i do a lot of kind of mark making stuff too so it depends but um the more mark making stuff that's 
you know, ink and um, I've made paint out of cigarette ash and use that. Oh, you have um, a lot of that. Plenty, plenty. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll take that and mix an acrylic medium and use that as a paint and you'll get this really uneven texture. And I can do those on canvas sometimes, but I prefer wood panels. But then the more illustrative ones, that's just straight up acrylic. And also with the abstract ones, um, I'll use oil too or something. I'll, I'll use whatever with that. But um, yeah, then everything else is all the illustrations. So it's pen and ink and those are all the mediums. It, it, you've been in this room that I'm yeah, sitting in. Right? I've been there. So um, there's probably like over 20 grand worth of shit in this room. And it looks like a fucking dumpster. But the shit that is in here, like two ounces of cadmium red paint can be like 40 bucks. So you saw all those tubes of paint that are in here and all the different shit. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, uh, yeah. You had a lot so, of really cool things at your house, especially the paintings that you had. I love all those. Going back to San Diego and your time with Rat Tail. Yeah. And some firsts as far as artists go. You're like the first artist to have a full page ad. Yeah, man, that was of Just being an artist for 4 by 4 where you're holding the balloons and you yeah, and John Elliott did a photo shoot on the beach. Tell us about that. Oh, man. Um, shit. So, uh, hold on, give me a second. This is a good one. Uh, I have to grab a beer from this one. So, um, so yeah. Um, so you know about the, it was three separate shoots. Oh no, that was two separate shoots. So I don't know if you were there for the first one at the burlesque show. No, I wasn't. Okay. So John takes me to this burlesque show. He's like, yeah, I know um, some of the performers and we'll get some shots with you with uh, a couple of the burlesque dancers. And uh, I'm like, all right, I've never been to one of those before. And um, we go in there and there is a uh, someone on stage with just beautiful fans um, dancing to Green Fuzz by the Cramps. And if you know that song, you can imagine how cool this whole thing was. And I was like, holy shit, this is awesome. So, um, you know, John's talking to people or whatever. I'm just watching the show. And then John's like, yeah man so the show's gonna end you get up on stage um after everybody clears out and we're gonna have the dancers all around you and um you know whatever so i'm like what the fuck all right man so i get up on this uh, i sit there and they're like pulling on my hair and like pulling on my clothes and all this stuff and it was weird i don't think john told them what the context was for what this portrait was even gonna be um but uh <laughs> or what it was for anything so um we shoot that whole thing. Then, uh, then man, um, one of the dancers was like, you guys should come hang out at my house. I thought you were there for this part though, but I don't know. Um, I, I don't remember. I, I, it's all, the photos are coming back to me. So no, 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 they're not. They're not. They're not? No, they're not. So, um, I can guarantee they're not. Okay. So, um, well, maybe I was there because it's kind of like, it sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah. so, um, cause I thought I, I, so we go back to that dancer's house and you guys, I thought you were there. You guys all leave. And she jumps in front of the door and locks me in the house. Mm, yeah, I remember this now. Yeah, I was yeah. there. So yeah, she locked me in the house and wouldn't let me leave. And I think I had to tell her I was married or something. And that's how they let me leave the house. Because I told them they were married, or I told them I was married. That was so weird and intense. I'm like, and it wasn't the the dancer that that performed to uh, Green Fuzz. It was another one. But yeah, that was so weird. And then I get out of the house and I just start running uh, to try to find you guys. I had no idea where the hell I was, but I ended up finding you guys. And then I was I thought I was telling you because you were just laughing at me. But maybe it was that. No, that sounds about right. <laughs> Maybe it was the next day. Um, 
so then we we you know we're hanging out all night i can't remember where at um it might have been i swear i saw you because it might have been your house because you had that one setup with all the monitors um not at your old place but i think it was the next place i think this was the same time maybe you were still at the old place at the I think you were still at the old place at that time because that's when I met Angie and Kato and uh, Matu and I mean, I don't know, man. There's so many, but anyway, um, yeah. So we we hung out all night and then um, John's like, yeah, man, we got to go get these pictures developed. So we're going to drop them off at this. It looked like a toll booth, but it was a film developing place i don't know if you guys have used that place before but john seemed to be familiar with it so cars parked we're both hung over and john goes to take the film out and i just hear him go oh, fuck i'm like what it's like ah oh, nothing so he like pulled the film out goofy and then he hands it to them we go we came back like a couple hours later i think got something to eat and get the the film back and it's just all white so when he went to open the camera he fucking exposed the whole roll and we just didn't get all those shots everything gone oh so man then, that's a bummer yeah so then we had to um come up with a quick plan and the, the plan was just go to the beach and i'm like what if i had balloons so we went to a florist and bought all those balloons I'm in that three-piece suit on the fucking beach in San Diego <laughs> holding a thing of balloons. And that's when and you like, had, like, the big hair, too. Yeah, I had the Thunder's, like, teased-out hair and, uh, like, silent movie makeup on. So John's just like, yeah, just go walk up there. So I'm, I'm just standing in the middle of the beach, and people are just staring at me. And there was um, the one shot that we used, that closer portrait was cool. But there's one shot from there I wonder if I have it on my computer, if you have it. The, the one with the guy with the surfboard, that was the my favorite of the shots because it looked like some 50s, like, go-go beach mystery fucking thing because the dude had a longboard. So it just looked, I looked just especially out of place because it looked like it was maybe a shot from the 50s or 60s that I'm just standing there. That's my favorite shot from that series, but... um yeah, there was the portrait, another one with me just standing there. And then that one with the guy just happened to be, he ran into the shot and John's like, oh, we got to shoot it again. And then we got him back and I was like, oh man, I think that's the shot. But you guys went with that full portrait uh, one. And that was with the story, with the contract that like set a precedent for everything that we did. And it was, uh, that was a cool idea. And that was executed very well by you guys. Yeah, I love that one. I also think that's like, your best hair phase. Like you've always had good hair, but that's like that teeth <laughs> hair was like pretty good. I like it. Never that. held up. In, it never held up in skating, man. I needed like uh, Jim Greco's uh, girlfriend hairstylist from two thousand five. <laughs> it seemed to hold up in skating well. Mine always just died. Back to Caspa. You said Caspa is like not really a company. It's like an art project, but you did have a team like in that heyday period right i mean you had like yeah. micah who's all on the team yeah, it's pretty much the it's pretty much the group of friends and um the, you know those guys are like family to me um but it was charles first uh then micah micah i met at the ground control asr booth when john flew me out um i think yeah that, that's that might have been the life plus trip i'm not sure I think, um, and I can't remember if it was that trip or not that um, the Razors video came out with Micah's section to uh, Moon Age Daydream. Yeah, I made that video. Yeah, that that's that video. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, it was uh, Charles, Micah, then Charles started skating with Ollie for Rosies, and then Ollie and. Um, Shit, am I missing somebody? Why does it seem like I'm missing somebody? Well, maybe they haven't been around, but um, um, it just had kind of this cult status. But that was the team, but it, it it's not really a, it's more of a, 
um, an incubator for kind of ideas, I guess, in a way, um, just to kind of bring some thought into skating instead of it just being about skating. Um, there were a lot of people with that, um, that would see the Casper shirts or see us or whatever and, and be like, you rollerblade? Like we thought it was all spandex and Oakley's, you know? And um, a lot of people would buy the shirts, the Casper stuff, just because they thought it was cool. It had nothing to do with skating, you know? And that, that was really kind of the idea with it to bring skating out instead of keeping it, you know, in the bubble that it, it lives in, you know, and um, just try to kind of make a, uh, a different representation of what skating is instead of what the stereotypes are. And we continue to kind of break that, but at least now there are a lot more options. At the time there were, you know, you're either a hip hop dude or nothing, you know, so, and we're not like, you know i'm not anti-hip-hop in any way but it's just you know sort of that white suburban cul-de-sac paper gangster bullshit uh, i don't really you know dig that and teach their own but i don't know i don't dig the attitude that comes along with it so we're more kind of uh, the idea of thinking instead of just following trends or whatever and then what about now i know like was it like last year you were adding kind of a team together? What happened with that? With like, what who's on the team now? Um, as far as I know, uh, Philip Moore, uh, Matty Schrock. Um, well, we're bouncing around with a few things. Brian Weiss, um, I've been sending stuff to, but it's again, it's a loose team. But the people that I wanted to be involved with it, um, were also Daniel Henderson, uh, who I think is a great skater that, that uh, um, I don't think has gotten enough recognition, but um, he started, he's building a family right now, so I, I'm not expecting anything whatsoever. Um, but um, everybody that I've contacted, and, and, and Stefan Brando, of course, um, I think are, most people know that one, but um, everybody that's involved with it, uh, I love Brian's photography, Philip. Um, I love Philip's stance on a lot of things. Uh, we agree in a lot of about a lot of things, and I really like Philip's attitude. Um, Stefan, amazing skater. I've known him since he was a little kid coming into the Erie skate park, and I, you know, his dad was always really nice. And Stefan, um, I I love Stefan. Stefan's great, but uh, Stefan's also an artist as well um so every and daniel uh is shreds on guitar so everybody that's involved it isn't just about their skating it's you know they have other interests and do things you know so um that those people are the kind of my top picks for uh who i'd like to be involved with it and it's just like you know, here's some stuff, you know, I'm not expecting anything crazy. If you have the time, do it. Um, but it's just more about the principle, anything more than anything than it is um, about it trying to be a skate brand or anything like that. It happens to be a skate brand, but that's not 100% uh, the focus of it. It's more about the idea of it existing. I know you just said you're not trying to have him do things, but in an interview that we did with BMAG in 2009, you had said that you were going to come out with a Casper video mm -hmm. and that never happened. What yeah. happened with that project? And is there any chance of doing a Casper video with the guys you have now? Um, I would like to see it happen. Um, like I said uh, earlier, the, uh, I lost all of the Casper stuff, uh, late last year. And, um, so now I'm rebuilding it. So it, when that comes along and the next stuff comes out, um, maybe that idea can be reapproached, but the first one, um, there was a lot that happened there. Um, rejects had just dropped and those were everybody involved in the company then, um, you know, rejects was kind of a hub for all of us to meet at basically. So we could film with that, but then 
um, a lot of unfortunate things happened within the industry and then with uh, our personal lives. Um, you know, the thing that happened with Rosie's was a big blow uh, that really screwed up our avenues to uh, travel or um, get things done because you know I don't have anybody to film uh, that I can send somewhere or whatever but you know there was Sean but then Micah would have to go to Alabama and all this stuff and I'm not a you know a corporate company so we're trying to find routes to make this stuff happen it just um, it just couldn't come together but uh, I don't know it's um, it's not a bad thing I hope to see something with these guys because they're pretty rad, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure you can get oh, yeah, it together. And, and on top of it, uh, they're like my favorite skaters out right now too. So I'm very, very privileged to have Well, perfect. To have you know, it's like Matty Schrock and like Stefan, like I, all those guys, you know, I've loved their skating for so long. So it's cool to see them all underneath the Casper family. Earlier you had mentioned Chris Edwards. He lives in Pittsburgh, you live in Pittsburgh. How often Correct. do you see Chris Edwards? And uh, did you have anything to do with this birth project he's working on? Did he ask you to do any um, work for it? I dealt with a few things. Um, uh, like I cleaned up the graphic, the, the birth logo graphic, um, just small things. And um, he wanted a couple things for uh, Jaron that's more my wheelhouse. Um, so we did that. I don't even know if it came out. It was kind of a Chris wanted like a misfits kind of thing. So, um, I helped him with that, but just a few things, but nothing, nothing crazy, uh, as of yet. So he's, um, he's going steady with it, but I, I like the idea that he had with, uh, that really made me want to get involved was, uh, the focusing on getting younger kids into skating, uh, now that the parents are getting back into it or, you know, people had to go to college and, you know, they had a family and everything. And now that things are more relaxed and their lives are getting back into skating. So, um, you know, Chris is always putting stuff out with Canyon, his son. And, um, so he just was trying to give an opportunity for those people to have a place to go as far as a company within the industry. So I really dug that idea of getting uh, some uh, new people involved, you know? So uh, I see Chris, at least once a month so um fairly often but we'll we'll talk every now and then and um there was a minute we were hanging out a lot but uh i think i was getting too damn drunk doing that so i had to take a break that sounds uh it had to be pretty rough for you to get too drunk oh uh, yeah yeah <laughs> um we were just sitting there talking and you know hearing stories from chris and you know I'm just listening because I'm hanging out with Chris Edwards, you know, so I'm just sitting there drinking straight. And then, you know, I go to get up and I'm like, oh, shit, I haven't talked at all. And I've just been sitting here drinking, you know, so uh, it'll get you drunk just doing that. But just hanging out with Chris is, uh, yeah, Chris is a good guy. So what brought you to Pittsburgh in the first place? Um, I had to get out of Erie, man. Erie's, uh, I think I've said this before. Um to you, but I say it often when people ask. I've been all over the place, and um, Erie is still the weirdest place I've ever been. And uh, it's, especially then, um, it's a pretty drab, drab place with a lot of not so great elements. So um, I just had to get out of there. And uh, it was cool to, you know, especially during the, t- the time of four by four, um, living off of royalties because I could just get up and go anywhere but then I wanted to shift over into fine art and that doesn't it costs money a lot of money to start doing that so my money from illustration was getting cut out so I didn't really uh because I wanted to spend my time doing fine art so um uh I couldn't travel as much and I didn't want to be there so I'm like fuck I'm just moving so I was already showing down in Pittsburgh pretty frequently in art shows. So um, I have a bunch of friends down here that I'd work with in those shows and uh, just decided to move down here and 
you know, if I'm already showing here and selling here, I might as well just move down. So I think I waited for a couple of pieces to sell and just got out of there. Where you live now is on a pretty busy street with bars on it. Yeah. How We're distracting is it to live in a place that's that noisy and, and so many places you can go you know, <laughs> have some and beers and food? <laughs> uh, no, man, it's, it's pretty much, you know, it's, uh, it's my element for the most part. Um, I will, I don't, my, usually my rule is I don't start drinking till after midnight. So I'll, I'll be at a bar hour, hour and a half, you know? Um, so it's not like, yeah, five o'clock time to go to the bar. Like some of these people that are down there, man, it's, it gets pretty wild. But, um, the goofy thing is, um, you know, all the people that are trouble aren't, don't live here. They all come to visit because this is kind of a, you know, the strip of bars and everything. But um, no, it's, it's cool because that's what I used to do when I worked for you guys too. Was uh, I'd work all day, most of the day, um, doing art and then uh, midnight. So I, I might work from six in the morning till midnight and then go to the bar, have maybe six beers and a shot or two, come back. Um, I've been illustrating all day, come back, paint, and then pass out and then do it all, all over again, you know? So, um, and then maybe take a Saturday and actually not work. So, but that's, if you want to do art professionally, that kind of has to be your schedule. You have to, you have to grind like that a lot, unless you, you know, if you work in the academic field, you can have a steady thing and then make your art on the side or anything like that. But if you're doing, uh, trying to do fine art or illustration or just be an artist, and doing, you uh, candle at both ends uh, until you find um, a collector or a gallery that represents you that can sell your work consistently. You, you never know when you're going to get paid and you have to work overtime all the time to kind of get by or make a living so even if the bars are all there you can't fuck around because if you do you want to have anywhere to live right now that's 100 percent true um with your skating i know you suffered some injuries kind of stepped back from aggressive skating somewhat throughout yeah. the years like when did you kind of step back from skating what happened injury wise and have you been doing any skating lately like i know you got a big wheel set up yeah. You put on aggressive skates at all? Yeah, I have. Um, going back to Edwards, he was doing those. Um, he did a couple events here uh, with um, Ray Mendez, which that's that blows my mind. Um, getting to that talk to Ray and hang out with Ray, because like I said, uh, my first thing, the thing that got me into skating was Ray was part of, you know, so. Ray has been in the studio as well and hung out. And uh, so that, that's pretty wild to me. But um, uh, Chris had a couple events of bringing people in. And um, uh, actually, I lost, I lost track on that one, Jan. What was it again? We were talking about, like, first of all, when did you kind of stop skating? Oh, yeah, yeah, Why yeah. did you stop skating? And then have you so, like been skating last, again now? The last time. The last time I skated, um, I got a pair of sways. Uh, this is like a year or two ago. And um, I have a 12 or 13 skate. So it's kind of hard to find. I have wide feet, so it's hard to find options um, for something comfortable. Because I, I used to, and skating those Majestic 12s, as much as I loved them, doing a backslide on that was just like one of the most painful, <laughs> painful things. Um, but um so i've had these sways they were cool chris had an event brought some guys in and i put some i put the sways on to test out and um i rolled around a little bit i think i got a toe roll on a like a six or eight foot box and a sole and then i went to do a top sole and my knee was just like hey man you don't do that anymore so um uh i have to be really careful with that because my tendon is just completely calcified under my kneecap so um or not completely but it's it's really bad 
tendonitis on that. So um, being a fine artist doesn't really lend itself well to a good insurance plan. So I have to be pretty, uh, pretty careful with what I do uh, with that. And especially I work with my hands. If I break my hands, I'm at six weeks out of work, you know, so I can't really do that. Um, but the big wheel option, man, that's, uh, that's a lot of fun. Um, I can still skate. I love skating. Um, I've just kind of already done all the stuff that I wanted to do. You know what I mean? If I see something, you, you never, skating eyes never leave you. You know, you, you view architecture a certain way. It's over for the rest of your life. You're going to be like, yeah, man, you could bonk that. You'd be 80 years old. You could be like, man, you could bonk that wall and then like go over that rail and people won't know what the fuck you're talking about, but you'll still always see that stuff that way. Um, and I still do too. Uh, totally. But I can't just put skates on and go, you know, oh man, that drop rail would be really cool. To, you know, I'm like, eh, I'm, I'm good on that, you know, but um, doing the big wheel stuff is really satisfying. Um, it's just fun to go fast, man. Like I'm passing bikes and shit on, on trails, you know, I'm just, it's super fun. And you have a really cool trail system right by your house that goes it's around amazing. that whole river. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, I still have to figure out how to cross one of the bridges, but uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's what, two blocks? It's two blocks from my place. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. Yeah, you know, I was there. Neil, you know, took us on a tour. Yeah, of, yeah. Of the trails, and okay. I was really I nice that. of him, and mm -hmm. he was really cool, and the other guy I met was really nice. Like, the scene seems pretty decent there. Yeah. Um, when I first got here, I did not – I was looking to skate more, and I just didn't really find many people. Um, I think I went out a couple times, uh, but I didn't really know that many people. Like uh, – um, I think Stefan maybe didn't live here then, but um, Cheeseburger's here. That that's somebody that I would have I would have skated with more. But I don't know. It was kind of a weird clicky scene, um, and I, I just didn't really at that time really want to answer questions constantly about the industry and stuff like that. And you know, I'd like to just go skate and not be answering if I know this person or I know that person. But you know. It's, it gets kind of, uh, I'm sure you understand, it's kind of tedious if you just want to, you know, hang out or do something, you're sitting there, you're working now, you know, instead of just being able to do something, you know. Um, so I didn't really skate that much when I, when I first got here. But um, I don't know, I just kind of never really got back into it after that. But the, uh, the big wheel thing, that's, I don't know, I'll always love skating. It's just, I know my limits, you know, and I, I'm kind of at that limit and I've jumped 30 stairs and I've jumped or, you know, done whatever rails and weird shit on rails. I don't need to do it again. You know, no. I'm, I'm, you, know. you know, I mean, we had our fun. Now it's just about having fun in a different way. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it's, uh, to me, it's just as satisfying, you know? Um, yeah, I don't, um, uh, that whole energy, I'm over it, you know, I've matured past that, not to say it's immature in any way, um, but I've just gone past that level of uh, wanting to be competitive or wanting to beat this object or, you know, myself uh, or my, my limitations in my head. I've gotten past that. And I, I've take that energy more into art now than I did in skating, but without skating, I, I don't know if I would have tested my, uh, uh, skating tempered me a lot. Um, to know what my, or, or at least know the levels to challenge myself. So um, if it wasn't for skating, I probably wouldn't have the, the work ethic that I do in doing fine art. You know, also another abstract concept um, being that rollerblading has never really been that popular, but I wanted to do it. You know, same thing in art, it's popular, but it's very difficult to um, be ready for what the, uh, what's gonna happen doing that, you never know, you know, the, that randomness is always there. It's chaotic. I want to ask you just about some of the brands you work with. 
Intuition. You've been working with Matt Mickey for a really, really long time, making shirts. Love Matt. Yeah, Matt is uh, Matt is one of my favorite people. And how did that, like the first shirt you did, how did that happen? Did he approach you? And then like how often do you make even... shirts for him now? Matt has always treated me like such a person and just been so decent to me that I can't even remember how we started working together because he always talked to me even though he didn't know me as though we worked together or he knew me, you know, so that, and that's just the sh uh, uh, a shine to Matt's personality and him as a person. So I don't even know the first thing that we worked on, but uh, I know that if Matt ever calls, I'm down to do something. So um, yeah, man, I can't even, uh, no, that's, that's a crazy question because I can't even remember the first thing we worked on together. But um, every time I'd see Matt, um, I think maybe the first time we talked, uh, I had called him about maybe ordering some Casper stuff for Intuition. That's most likely the first time we talked. And um, Matt brought up uh, maybe the four by four stuff. Or so. He already knew stuff about me because Matt loves, absolutely loves skating and he knows everything that's going on. Um, and uh, it probably happened from there um from the four by four stuff and but like i said even meeting me without knowing me or anything he, he was always he's always been the same person so yeah matt i have nothing but good things to say about Matt. awesome yeah but matt's such a cool guy and he's done so yeah. much with his shop and for people in Man. the sport yeah he's he's definitely uh he's definitely in, in running for you know skating sainthood so your main project now in blading is working with Lawrence with Chroma. Correct. Now, how did that whole thing come together? And when I talked to Lawrence, he was kind of saying it was his kind of ode to four by four in a way. Yeah. Like, do you feel that way uh, as well? He's, uh, I, I would maybe take that as, um, for the amount of attention to detail that he wants to put into something. So just to say, um, with four by four, um, so the idea with four by four with, um, all the designs was that, uh, working in a skate shop, um, how rollerblade wheels are laid out is in the glass counter and you see them from above and they're next to a bunch of other wheels. So the idea with four by four was that that's how the wheels are presented. So I wanted them to stand out as much as possible from the other wheels. So, um, uh, and also kind of, you know, since we didn't have the approach that early Senate stuff had with, you know, the mini pizza box or, you know, the Crayola uh, base design and stuff, you know what I mean? Um, so the art had to really stand out. There wasn't like the design aspect of the, uh, you know, the gimmick, you know? So, um, but with this, uh, Lawrence really gets that idea. And I think that's, that's kind of what he has in his head. So saying the four by four thing, I think he means that level of making it stand out and be different and quality. So um, the packaging, everything, um, you know, he wants the whole feel for everything, you know, and it, it's, uh, it's really cool to see that. And I know, you know, it, it's, it's definitely a labor of love um, from Lawrence completely. And uh, to work with somebody like that, that wants to do that is, you know, and is uh, extremely respectful uh, to the artist about it. And I couldn't ask for anything more uh, with working with somebody in the industry. Um, uh, I don't know how much I can say about this. Just finished a new one. Uh, I can say that and that's coming out. And again, I mentioned it earlier, but it's probably one of my favorite things I've done in skating um, from the, the packaging and, and Lawrence completely gets it, which is such a bonus. Um, but I think, I'm not sure, but Brandau may have uh, sort of set this up, but I'm not entirely hundred percent sure, but I don't, I'm not sure, but um, yeah, Lawrence contacted me about it. And I, I think Steph may have 
mentioned something. I can't remember exactly how it happened, but it was it was in the works. And um, uh, again, Lawrence gets it, so it's it's cool to, you know, he has kind of the idea of people might buy these and collect them. Uh, people might not even ride them, you know. So just kind of it's an ode to the the level that we achieved uh, working on four by four and. I think the. Uh, I have my, I have here. Hold on one second. Sorry, as you were saying, people, you know, collect them, to collect them. I have mine yeah. displayed on the shelf in my oh, office nice. here. Awesome. So nice. I have the Chroma brand out wheels. Nice. On my shelf, I have the shirt. It's awesome. I love it, and I oh, love the graphics you did with for China. I think it's a uh, really cool the you know doing the wheels with the stickers and the t-shirt yeah with each one that, that, like... that's all that's all Lawrence that, that's all what what Lawrence wanted um there was nothing like uh me saying yeah we should do stickers and we should do all the Lawrence had this whole thing planned out before I, I'm just filling in the template for what he set up um yeah it's a it's a really cool it's refreshing for to have a steady client like i haven't uh i haven't been able to do something like this in a while you know so it's it's cool at this level where it's you know like what we did with four by four with um the sandman line and you know having everything organized in these certain things uh you know where, where design is is approached and there's a instead of it being the Christmas line or the spring line, each each line had a name and it was, you know, that was just a really cool thing. This is similar to that. So each, uh, each wheel I'm working directly with the rider. Um, everybody has been super cool to work with. It's, uh, it's been a really great experience. And, you know, no, hey, what's uh, crazy right now is the price of wheels, you know, with, with COVID and everything, you know, when we did rat tail, it was like 28, dollars for set of four now it's yeah. like 58 dollars for set of four yeah yeah it's, insane. yeah it's nuts man it's nuts um yeah it's a mess um and like i said i don't know the numbers exactly with everything but i you know th this is definitely a labor of love with chroma and uh it's um it's an ode back to the industry uh so if you don't support it uh maybe check it out I i'm not really making you know, uh, uh, it's nothing really to uh, making a million dollars doing it, but it's something for rollerblading that is, man, it's, it's a really cool thing. Um, so and just that, very collectible. Just yeah, exactly. on somebody's shelf, you know, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. People are asking about, you know, does anybody have an old Senate, uh, halo S shirt or whatever right now? these things in the same period of time of distance between that shirt and what's going on now, these wheel packaging and everything, Lawrence has completely thought way ahead and that idea, uh, people will be asking about those sets of wheels and um, how Lawrence has been running it. It's definitely going to be, uh, it's a nice stamp on rollerblading in its history. So as far as collectible wheels, some of the wheel graphics you made for four by four I've seen, you know, unused sets sell between two to four hundred dollars a set before what? on eBay and on private trades what? for some like really rare <laughs> wheels. Um, what do you think about oh that? My, I had no idea. Yeah, that's that's what I think of it. What? Uh, <laughs> that's crazy. I, I think I have a few sets sitting around here, but I I, I gave most of them away. Yeah, um, if you had um, if I had a box of them still. It'd be really nice, but I, I had a few sets left over that I sold like when I needed some money, like, I don't know, two years ago, I was broke yeah. and I needed to sell some stuff and it was amazing what I sold some little sets of wheels for. What? That's crazy. <laughs> that is nuts. Wow. See, that's kind of funny to me because um, I, I, I think it's really cool. It's uh, that's that's great. I think it's funny that um like you were saying all the artists that are in this industry and they'll do they'll do things like product uh whatever products whatever uh soft goods or uh hardware anything um 
that people will buy that stuff, but they don't actually go support the artist, like buying paintings or prints or anything. It's uh, that is kind of like, weird, isn't it? Yeah, you'll you'll have Ed Templeton and skateboarding, and now that guy's, you know, he, he's a great artist, and people would go to his art shows and stuff like that. I don't know if I've ever had a rollerblader even show up at my art shows. I think that the the, the 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 thought process is, is a little different. It's like, you know, what it is. It's you have these guys. It's the same in BMX, and you know, like BMX is even crazier. The stuff that stuff you know, bikes sell for and everything. But yep. you know, it's like any collectible. It's like it's stuff you could necessarily afford when it was new. Right, right, right. right. And yeah. and you really wanted it, or you really liked it, and it's like the nostalgia. Yeah. So it's like not even right. about the artist really. It's about it's something yeah, exactly. that you could have and now you have money you have a good job and you can actually exactly. afford it yeah, yeah. So. and that's what i'm saying of kind of building that bridge with um putting more of a focus on culture in rollerblading of what dating culture actually is and um appreciating where your stuff comes from you know it's one thing you know that a maybe a the screen printer is printing with an automatic press with the, you know the robot screen printing you know thing um, but if there's a, an artist that actually hand screen prints the shirt, then it becomes more than a shirt. It's a piece that's by that person. And people can't really tell the difference between the two. And I, I just find that odd because um, they love the nostalgia, but they don't care about the history. You know, that's that seems it seems like those two things should be kind of linked together. But it's uh, it's just ignored for um, the sake of satisfying their own, you know thirst for having what they didn't have but i don't know i think things like that slowly kind of that's why amazon has pretty much taken over everything you know people just like the convenience they don't really care about what happens to the people involved you know but the new thing you're doing with chroma is one of your favorite things you worked on what's some other yeah. of your favorite projects you've done both inside and outside of skating uh one uh, working with matt mickey whenever that happens um uh working with any new company coming out um where you can tell that the you know there's a passion there for example like the shirt you're wearing those guys are great um the come down guys um whenever my favorite stuff i guess i don't really have specifics it's more about sort of the spirit of the project that i remember so uh, when people are great to work with, but also they mean it and they have intention and the intention is being executed accurately to what, you know, as close to ideal as it could possibly be um, as, a, as an artist to be able to achieve any kind of uh, anything close to that is really um, satisfying. And um, you can tell that there's a, a permanence to it. And that's really, that's what my job is, is to try to achieve permanence. You know, it's not necessarily drawing. That just happens to be what I'm doing. But the, uh, the, the, the goal is to make something permanent. So whenever something comes together like that, that's when it's cool, you know. So we, we achieved that with 4 by 4 I don't think, you know, that, that whole thing was a boogeyman for the industry. Um, that was a really cool, you know, obviously a really cool thing. Um, Casper has been around forever and it's you know until i die it's going to exist um and even after that happens it's probably still going to go maybe even some of those people that have ignored it will start paying attention um you know, that's how it always works the the stereotype of art you know but um i'm not trying to be cryptic or dark but uh just kind of noting that that people don't really appreciate something until it's there you know Bowie's albums and Prince albums sold through the fucking roof, you know, recently and, you know, whatever. But um, as, as soon as they passed, but uh, that's always kind of the curse of it. But um, yeah, I, I would say things that allow an opportunity for a greater concept to come in instead of just money being made, you know, um, that's nice, but, you know, I don't know if it, uh vanilla ice has to be vanilla ice the rest of his fucking life you know like <laughs> i never want to be like that you know i want to be able to you know have some artistic integrity you know 
and I don't know the guy personally, maybe he's really nice, but you know, when the name comes up, you know, I, I just don't want to do that. So as long as I can keep integrity and I get treated with respect, it's always a good project to work on. I know some artists who similar type of style to you who have embraced NFTs and it's like changed their life. They're selling, you know, thousands of things. Have oh, you, really? Have you looked into that? Um, some, uh, uh, some people have hit me up about it. Um, I had some thoughts on it. Um, I'm waiting to talk to them uh, first before I jump into anything. And if I have somebody that's going to sponsor it, I can do that. And if we come up with a decent contract of percentages, um, and I'm not limited to just doing it, if it was a one-time deal and I can learn how it works through the contract and it's negotiated right, um, I'd be comfortable messing around with it because it's not going to hurt, you know. It's uh, it's not going to take it. If someone thinks an artist doing an NFT decreases the how valid the artist is or the validity of their work, then you know, fuck them anyway. But um, you know, it's new, something to try, newish. Um, so if, if if somebody can sell me on it, then I I, I participate in it. But I, I didn't. I haven't seen anything that is like my work. I, I've only this is seen... more like guys who do. You know, it's a bunch of old awesome punk guys that do like old punk posters style art. Oh no shit! They're okay. doing art. They're NFTs and they're selling like thousands of them. You know, like and and they... when you sell them, it's like next time they get sold, you always make a royalty off every sell. You know, so it's right. like they just trade hands. And I mean, yeah, you know, a, a lot of people are like, it's stupid or whatever, but. I see these guys man. posting on Facebook and how it's like changed their lives completely. Hey man, uh, the idea of uh, greed through money is stupid, but the idea of uh, survival through money is very important. So money uh, sometimes isn't a bad thing and I wouldn't mind uh, making some, you know? So yeah, I'd definitely be into it. And it's not, yeah, it's not at anybody's really expense other than my risk of my legitimacy as a serious artist but if people are already involved in it uh, you know might as well i have some ideas uh to circumvent that uh potentially anyway so uh, um that i haven't heard of anybody doing yet but somebody's probably coming up but i've been reading more about what people are doing with the metaverse thing and uh, i kind of want to get in um, early on some concepts with that so I have designs for everything. So if I can just make them and okay, shit just pops in my head. And if I have an opportunity to make it, make some money off of it. But I had a design for a, a tea set that was, I don't know why, the other day. And I just wrote it down in my book. I'm like, shit, man, if I could make that and make it an NFT, fuck it. You know? People can buy it in the metaverse at the Bed Bath & Beyond. They can buy my fucking tea set whatever you know it's just floating out hey why not well that'd be really cool i'll try to send you some of those links so you can check them out did you yeah, i'd love that somebody had mentioned that you turned down zero skateboards is that a real thing that happened you, you, do you remember this i don't because my memory has just faded in the past 20 years i could i could uh see why that could have happened between a couple nights that we've uh, hung out <laughs> Um, but, uh, uh, so you had some, you called me, I think from the party. So you had people over at your house and, um, you're like, Hey man, uh, one of the guys from black box was here. And, um, I was like, Oh, cool. And, and uh, you're like, Hey man, what's your, how's your guys line coming together? Blah, blah, blah. And you were totally, you know, taking a piss to the dude you know and uh, <laughs> uh he told you what the line was and everything and you're already sitting at the computer i guess like bringing the stuff up this is the first four by four line and you're uh, you know as a rollerblader i think it was kind of a fuck you to the dude and it's like yeah here's our line and um the guy asked for my information so uh i can't remember if 
you told me that I was supposed to contact him to remind him or if he contacted me, I can't remember. But we started talking and um, they were like, yeah, man, you got to move out to, uh, I think it was Carlsbad or something. That's where Black Box was at the time. And uh, they're like, yeah, man, uh, you got to move out here and then we'll get you a job. And it's like, you know, 40 hours a week in an office. And I'm like, 40 hours a week in an office doing fucking art. Fuck that. You know, it's just, it was just ridiculous. So, um, and also the amount that those guys get paid, it's like, it's garbage. Um, unless you're a featured artist for a series, you're not getting anything. So, um, so yeah, I told them no. And um, I did uh, slightly entertain the idea of doing it. But as freelance, not moving out, I, I was thinking about trying to negotiate just a one-off line. And um, just so they could find out that a fucking rollerblader designed a line of skateboards for them. They would be, especially at that time, the jackass uh, Dave Carney era, that would have been a good fuck you to those people. But it didn't work out. So I just told them no and walked away from it. Well, it's funny because I don't know if you remember Eddie from Life Plus. It was like Drew, there was Drew, Corey, and Eddie, and Eddie was their skateboarder friend. I don't remember Eddie, no. Well, it was Eddie, and like him and Drew went to art school together. Eddie's a skateboarder. Eddie worked at Black Box as an artist. Okay. So he wonder, also made Life Plus. Okay. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. Yeah, Jesus Christ. Yeah, I wonder if that's how it came about or if someone was there because it was somebody. I don't remember who it would have been, but it could have been one of the skateboarders. Like we were friends with the guys from like Tomyoto. Um, but that was yeah. bef- Zero had already left Tomyoto for Black Box at that point. Yeah, that was were they still with them when they did the I don't know if it was the year before I was there when they rented the boat across from the convention center and they- they had guys coming into the show like dressed in military stuff and dragging customers out. I thought that was so cool, man. It was, it was just, yeah, I thought that was such a cool idea. Because it was something like the rates went up or something for booths. So it was cheaper for them to rent a private boat and park it in the water across from the convention center. What was it? It was like the train tracks and then the water's there. I can't remember. Yeah, it's like, well, that's no, the convention center and then there was like a park. And then there's the water. Okay. Yeah, so they had the people going in there, grabbing buyers and taking them over to the ship. That's fucking awesome. That's yeah, a- yeah. I remember when they raised the prices for the booths, like companies would, they would just rent like hotel rooms and like. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, you know, I think Razors ended up doing that. They would just have a hotel room and get you know buyers in there. I could see that. Yeah, the, the I think the last one I remember was uh, when they had, didn't John end up with that couch, that red velvet couch? I ended up with a red velvet couch. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you did. Yeah. 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 What a beaut. Yeah. That was from the Razor's booth. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm saying. It, that's the last, I think the last ASR. I went to like two or three of those. I can't remember. But um, yeah, I think that was the last one I went to when they had that red velvet couch and uh Whoever's Andy, Andy's partner, whatever it was at the time, I don't know what. Have you watched the um, the Von Dutch documentary on uh, Hulu? No, I haven't. Watch it; you'll laugh your ass off because it's so much about the bullshit and um, of like the, those trade shows. And said there's a big chunk about that and all that. Uh, I was cracking up watching it because I'm like, yeah, there's that makes sense. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'll have to check it out. That sounds check, funny. Yeah. I mean, that was yeah. a shit show. Mm. For me, for me, it was cool because I had premieres, like you know, those yeah, ASRs. Right. So you know, theater premieres, like it was awesome. Right. It was huge after yeah. parties. But yeah, it was a crazy time. Um, I remember John made all those ground control, those anti skateboarding <laughs> oh. ground control oh. posters that they put up all around San Diego. Uh, I remember the the business card debacle. I thought that's what you're going to talk about. Where mm, no. we were at like Inco's drunk, trying to cut up business cards for ASR the next morning, and we're trying to use the cutter. And when you went to stack them up, they were all different sizes and fucked up. And they were supposed to be. We had to find like closely matched size ones to lay out so they looked even. Yeah, it was 
it was bad Th- those That's were hilarious. those were lost weekends every time for sure good god yeah, yeah four was, by uh... fucking around with that scolari's office oh yeah the, the uh the, i thought that was at bar pink but the yeah the knife wielding gentleman that guy ended up in Austin years later. I saw him in Austin. Kobe, that's perfect. That's, <laughs> yeah, he was like a uh, he was like a Williamsburg hipster from the early two thousands with an LA coke habit that moved to San Diego. That's what that's what that guy. Uh, I think that sums that guy up. And I just only met him once with the fucking knife pointed at me. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm guessing that's a pretty fair assessment of that guy. It was, that uh, was, you know, yeah. He was pretty yeah. young, too, I remember. I wanted to, like, finish off this interview with some music questions. Uh, I know you were doing some DJing. But I wasn't really... It, it was just easier to call it DJing, but all I did was bring my computer and I made playlists and just clicked the button. Um it was more like curating the music for the night than it was actual DJing because I respect people that are able to handle vinyl and things like that. I wasn't doing anything close to that, uh, just to say that first. But um, uh, the pandemic cut that out. Um, so that job, I was doing that once a week. Then that job was cut out. And then they're like, I guess we don't really need this. So uh, one place has called me back um to to do it once so far and it was for like the holidays so that was cool of them to do that but um businesses are still trying to build themselves back up so they're not really willing to burn money on whatever you know so um any extra extra thing so even shows right now are they're picking back up i don't really know why but um i don't know i guess people uh can't live without entertainment on call at every moment even at the risk of other people dying but hey whatever man um uh but yeah so your answer no or i'm sorry to answer your question no i'm not dj well what about <laughs> <laughs> you tricked me with your flyers you made it seem like you were dj yeah um were they just coming up a bunch or something? I don't know. You would post them on your when you would have a night that you were gonna curate music. Yeah, every yeah, curate. I like I like making it as pretentious sounding as possible now. Um, uh, yeah, I'd put the flyers up every week, but that was that was a minute ago. Like, yeah, yeah, the the pandemic totally cut that out. So, at one place, I had a flyer. And then the other place I would do kind of, um, I would put up, oh no, no, I did, I changed the flyer over to that place. So yeah, I went to uh, Ruggers Pub um, and they let me do like a punk, kind of post-punk um, thrash sort of night. That was, that was definitely a fun night, play some <laughs> obscure stuff. Um, I even played Kiss a few times, so that's the measure of how much fun I was having that I allowed myself to play kiss for people that requested it. So that's awesome. I love a good post-punk night. What's your, what, what are five bands that you have been listening to the most lately? Um, geez. Oh my God. That's a tough one. Um, cause while I work, I just kind of play stuff and goes whatever, but what I listened to yesterday, um, I worked for like 16 hours yesterday or 17. In that period of time, I listened to um, Hunky Dory by David Bowie. Uh, I watched the uh, Spiders from Mars um, at the Hammersmith Odeon. If you're familiar with that, the performance from 77, it was like the last Spiders from Mars uh, concert. Um, and then I listened to, uh, Conan Moccasin, uh, his album Caramel, and then, uh, Future, and then Drake. So I listened. That's a good mix. 
Yeah, that was, that's what I listened to yesterday. Yeah. Oh, and um, Big Boy's latest album. That's what I listened to. How's that? To. It's pretty good. There's some, uh, there's some funny, like, um, well, I, I, I don't know what, what to call it, but there, there's um, the sort of, uh, I don't want to say like activist anthem trying to do things, but I don't know, there's like these socially aware things on there that I, I've, I've haven't heard from uh, in that way from, uh, from them before so um i was surprised by a few songs but it, it's it's really good and the production's really good it, it sounds um it has like that hands-on feel instead of everything being too polished which i always like a lot but uh that one's pretty good oh and um uh valerie june valerie june's really good um she goes kind of a little folky for me but some of her other stuff uh, it's killer it's really good and how that came about, uh, just a quick background was, um, I had talked to uh, Phil Gripper earlier in the day, a couple of days ago, and we were talking about, uh, we go back and forth and share music of stuff we find. So uh, um, I had talked to them and that kind of got the ball rolling on everything that I was listening to yesterday. So yeah, I don't know. Um, it's always changing and it's always going something different, but I can tell you that's the most recent, recent thing while I was working because as of lately, it's just been work. So, um, yeah, I, I haven't really got a chance to set, sit down and put something on and just kind of hang out in a minute. So, uh, it's kind of everything that's playing in the background. So that's the most recent. I have some playlists I should send you. I've got yeah, some I, good new stuff. Did I send you that? Um, that one playlist I used to DJ from the DJ 11 on my Spotify. You sent me something. I don't know if, if that was it or not. It's like a thousand songs. Um, or maybe so, somewhere around there, but it, it's a, it's a pretty substantial playlist, but if you hit shuffle on it, there's a lot of, uh, there's, it's pretty much just all B sides for the most part. Um, you might dig some stuff on there or find something that's pretty cool. Well, yeah, I'll um, give it a listen. I think, he, I think he did send to me. I'll have to check it out. Okay, okay. Yeah, you have to hit shuffle on that because it's all over the damn place. But um, And it's it's organized in instrumentals and then periods of the night because you get different people coming in at different times, usually different. So one of my favorite things uh, on my DJ night would be at, at one of the bars the, the other one i did that's the one that i used for the other bar that was uh you know there's a lot of 60s soul and 60s garage stuff and um then like uh some latin funk and uh, cool it's a cool mix and uh groups of people would come in expecting it, and it would be on a sunday night so they're expecting it to be saturday so they'd come in maybe 11 or 12 and um they're expecting it to be a Saturday night with whatever top 40 thing playing. So usually around then I put on some stuff with a pretty good beat to it. And they'd be complaining that there was, uh, they're like, can you play something that I can dance to? And I'm playing like, uh, I always give this example uh, specifically that I was playing Ike and Tina Turner and somebody made that complaint. And I'm like, if you can't fucking dance to this, like, I don't know what <laughs> people want to, you know, they want to hear what they have memorized because I don't know, white people can't or fucking can't dance and they need to have moves memorized to fucking be able to have a good time. I don't know what the fuck it is, man. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. But, I um, had that issue. Yeah, you know, I used to DJ a lot in San Diego and Austin. And yeah, I, remember, I guess, you at know, Blue, like, at Bluefoot. At Bluefoot, yeah, at Blue Bar Pink, at Booty Bar, Tower Bar. Oh, yeah, Beauty Bar. Holy shit. I forgot about that place. But, um, you know, I would get you know, just the most ridiculous, like, <laughs> requests. Dude. Yeah, I'm having a punk set, and somebody's like, can you play Nickelback? I'm like... Dude, <laughs> that just happened on... It, it happens every time, but um, what the hell did somebody ask me? They asked me to play... Because them and their friends came in, they're like, so you're the DJ. I'm like, eh. And, um, well, we want to hear, you know, Spice Girls and fucking fear is playing i'm like what 
what are you, what are you talking about? You know, uh, the, the uh, I don't know, the level of convenience that people expect is just uh, mind blowing. It's, it's at least now they're getting captured on uh, camera and being called Karens and all this shit actually being labeled. But man, they're in every shape and form. Man, it's, it's amazing. It is crazy. I feel bad for like the real Karens. Like the ones with the name Karen. The name Karen. Yeah. 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 They're fine. Yeah. So, yeah, I wanted to finish up with one of my last questions I always ask everybody is what do you love about rollerblading? Shit, man. Um, well, again, like I said at the beginning of the interview, rollerblading is my home. Um, uh, I love skating and the, the feeling of accomplishment of getting a trick uh, or something right. And, and um, uh, being able to land something in that, you know, that feeling, but then realizing that I could, like I was saying that I would tell the kids in the uh, camp I used to run being able to apply that feeling to doing other things, you know, and actually following through and working hard to do something. Um, and you don't have to risk your body doing it, you know? Um, so, you know, if you have an idea in your head, um, you know, if you work hard enough at it and, and uh, follow through with it, you can do, you know, you can do what you want and be where you want to be. And I'm a example of that. You know, as a kid, I wanted to be an artist and I don't have any training and, you know, don't have any financial backing, but, you know, I was able to make opportunities for myself and to, um, and, and I had a good enough uh, level of luck to deal with good people. And, um, but, you know, I worked and worked and worked at it. And um, that's what you got to do. When you think you're done, try doing you know, two more sessions of that, you know, you have to keep going, have to keep working, you know, and, um, you know, there aren't really many shortcuts left, you know, it's like, <laughs> I don't know what is like NFTs and weed, the, the next, uh, corner cutting, you know, I don't know, you know, um, like prohibition was or something, you know, um, if you don't already have a leg up in that, um, you know, you really have to work and, and it makes everything worth it, uh, definitely. And like I said, the idea of permanence, you'll make a, a better, more dense product. And, you know, I don't know, to me, it's more about legacy than it is about um, satisfying some urge to be famous or rich or anything like that. You know, I've, uh, you know, each each piece that I get done is sort of a monument to that time that I spent down and came up, you know? So the legacy is the most important thing, you know, in my opinion. So, uh, you know, uh, I don't make shit for money, but you know, if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, you can't deny that I was ever here. That's hard to beat. Yeah. I mean, so. you're definitely, it's, you know, I mean, it's one of those things. After you get hit by the bus, all your stuff will be worth so much money. <laughs> hey, man, beautiful. <laughs> but to go back to really, skating taught me all of that stuff. Skating taught me that standard to do that and what it was actually worth. Uh, getting a, you know, my, my favorite trick that I've ever seen anybody do. Um, I briefly met, mentioned this to uh, Jess Dearenforth, um, Chris and I or Chris rather had uh, Jess and I on a, a very brief um, uh, Instagram live thing. And um, I mentioned Latimer doing that parallel grab alley fish break in that bank. That's my favorite trick ever. I didn't know Jess shot that. So it just happened to be a coincidence that this came up and he's like, oh yeah, I shot that. I was like, well, shit. But that's my favorite trick ever like shot of anything ever and there are a lot of great ones but that one is my favorite bar none and um so for me to pull off a parallel alley fish brain was really satisfying to me to be able to do that but i could do if one person did something i can do it too um 
and being able to accomplish that and the satisfaction that came with that, I can apply it to other areas in my life. And it's also an opportunity for other people to view that in anything that you do to uh, kind of try to achieve your goals or at least um, uh, be understood. And I think that's a really, um, that's a really important thing that everyone should have an opportunity to have is to be understood and um, to be, to have value and be represented. Um, and skating kind of taught me that lesson. So uh, I feel that's very important. So skating again is my home. That's where, and that's where uh, part of that home lies is in that. Man, it's beautiful. I love it. Oh, oh, thanks. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you wanted to talk about? Probably a bunch of stories I shouldn't mention. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to mention those. <laughs> Who did I fight? What did I do? I don't know, man. But um, uh, again, to go back to it, too. Um, yeah, if, uh, if there's anybody out there that doesn't know, um, about the work of Brandon Negretti, you should really look that up. Speaking of uh, influential artists in, in the industry, um, anything that Brandon did, check it out. Uh, Brandon was a really important person in this industry and uh, you yourself as well, Jan. So if people don't know about, about it and just know you as this, you know, they should look into it. And uh, skating, you know, we should support the culture of skating and not just the action of skating, so. Ah, cool. Yeah. yeah, I'll put links to Negretti's videos in the description below so people could check oh, them out. Great. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, Brandon's the cool, Brandon was, yeah, yeah. Important, important person. Oh, for sure. I mean, yeah, he, he, he changed, uh, really changed the face of rollerblading during that era. And, and, and he brought, saw it. Mm -hmm. You know, he, it wasn't an accident. He didn't just do this thing. He, that's what the intention was, man. That's, you know that's that's a master stroke there that's it's pretty cool so yeah um, few and far between when something like that happens i just found the uh he had when we did the meantime we distributed through rattel he sent me and john elliott a promo video it's about 12 minutes long and i just watched that again yesterday like i got on my computer oh nice nice uh, it was pretty cool to yeah. see that yeah yeah wait that wasn't no I can't remember the um, Joy Division. I think that's in forever now. The ceremony. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I well, think I'm seeing that promo, but I can't remember. Yeah, the promo. I don't think anyone's really seen it because it was just like for me and John. Because it was like what oh. he sent us. It's the video he sent us to promote. In the meantime, to us to distribute it through Ratto oh shit okay i thought you were just saying the promo for the video oh that's awesome oh that's so cool and that goes back to what i was saying before about um uh if you want to find a job uh i guess if anything but all i can really speak on is um trying to do art you have to put the work in to make something to get somebody's attention just like I don't know, we, now everybody has edits, but I remember coming up skating that people would try to make sponsor me tapes, you know? So you made that set, that part of your day to do something extra, to try to get something that's, you know, that's, uh, and what Brandon did right there is a good example of it, of uh, doing extra work to try to get someone's attention to work with them. You know, you have to reach out and contact people if you want to work with them. They might tell you no, but don't be afraid of that. You know, so, so that, we got a sponsor me tape. Well, we got a lot of sponsor me tapes for 4x4, but the sponsor me tape that we got of a skater we actually added to 4x4 was from Alex Broskow, who sent the crazy sponsor me tape. Was it the same one as I heard of? I heard Legend of a Senate one. Is that true or? No, I don't think so. He sent you a fucking sponsor me tape, Broskow. Yeah. Dude, how insane was that? It was really insane. It was like this, you know, <laughs> footage that AJ had put together. It was a footage from a lot of old videos and stuff, you know, but it was just like this 20 minute sponsor tape that we watched at Shima's just mom's house. And we're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Fucking, yeah, I'm sure. That was Alex's, uh, uh, was always one of my favorite people to work with, or, or, or not even work with, I guess, but work for. Because Alex just 
had a decision and um you know he didn't like everything he'd say if he didn't like something but uh yeah um actually in one of the the a failed venture um he was the only person on the t or only only person involved in the thing that was just straightforward and it was very refreshing and that's how i'll always remember alex of uh being able to make a decision uh where no one else did so um yeah i really like alex a lot uh and man has that as far as skating goes like um alex right now has really come into their own place with everything the style the the style of skating the, i mean the fashion style everything Alex should be, but, you know, I'm, I'm sure Alex wants to live, you know, their own life, you know, but I think the ideal uh, example for rollerblading or one of them right now to get it out outside of the industry and for more people to see that could get people's attention. Um, I think it'd be Frankie Morales and Broscow and somebody should pay those guys a lot of money put them on jets and put them in fucking cell phone commercials and whatever. Uh, I think the industry would just grow exponentially from them starting that pattern because they have the whole, the whole thing, the, uh, man. But um, yeah. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Right. It, wouldn't it? Yeah. You know? uh, but who knows? But uh, Alex. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Alex right now is, man, just crushing it. Uh, but I haven't, you know, they've already done that. You know, they've already flown around and done all this shit and given so much of themselves as a person, probably physically and mentally, to the industry that, you know, you only have so much. But, man, it'd be fucking off. I, I really dig Alex, Alex's whole character right now. You know, thinking of it as a like G.I. Joe or comic book character, you know? That character is really cool in my head right now of uh, in skating. I think you're right. He's definitely, uh, I mean, he's always been so amazing, but right now he's, like, I feel like everything, he's just grown and gotten so much better with everything. Like, there's the maturity to, like, everything about him right now, you know? like the, But there's still a youthfulness to it. You know, I'm not saying anything uh, opposite of that. Um, but uh, it, it's just like it's just so cool it's everything he's nailing the whole 90s throwback thing perfectly the skating is beyond you know as it always is but now it's like the little shuffles and shit and just he can just throw all this stuff in there man it's just yeah it, um, uh, if he'd be up for it I don't know and not having to go win an X Games gold medal you know go film for something for eight hours and you just have to kind of roll around and not break your ass, you know, and get paid, you know? Uh, yeah. It's, it's frustrating to see that and that level of talent. And um, I know Frankie was featured in a few things, but um, you know, that's just Frankie. That's all the, that's all the weight on them, you know, but to have a few people in there, uh, somebody some corporation should step up for the greater good if they want to keep their business alive and fund those guys to go get around you know get them get them representation and put them in fucking music videos and all that shit uh it'd be amazing but well, we'll I see i mean skating's definitely been changing in the past couple of years so yeah it's always a potential for that to happen we'll see yeah yeah right yeah well we will see well, it's been uh, almost four hours with this interview. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just keep going. Just go all night. I'm very tired. <laughs> yeah, me too, man. I I would... two hours. <laughs> <laughs> that pot of coffee got me through, but shit. Well, I say we, uh, we call it on this one, and then we do a follow-up interview sometime in the future. Yeah, man. I'm down for that. Absolutely. That'd be cool as hell. Cool. So, well, Jeremy, thank you so much for joining me for the past four sure hours. Yeah, no sweat, yeah. And, uh, and I look forward to coming. What's that? 
anybody has that Civic issue, hit up me or Jan. Yeah, let us know if you have a pair of Jeremy Baytal Civica shoes. Yeah. Jeremy needs them. Let us know. <laughs> I just want to see who has them. It's uh, at the very least. It's just amazing to me. But but yes, it's been a, it's been a pleasure doing this uh, interview with you, Jan. It's uh, always great. And it's always great to talk to you. So yeah, likewise. I, I look forward to coming back to Pittsburgh and hanging out and doing some big wheel blading. Yeah, yeah. I'll uh, show up this time. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you so much for watching this interview with Jeremy Baytal. This will be the very last podcast in this format. So what I mean by that is I will no longer pre-record interviews with people. It takes a lot of time to chop them up, edit them. I edit the audio. It's a lot of work. This interview took over a month, almost two to put together with the supporting material, with the photos. I like the way it looks, but you know, when you don't make any money off these videos, it's not worth the time to put all that effort into it. So what I'm going to be doing moving into the future is all interviews will be live, which is going to be good for you because you can interact with the guest, ask questions. And it's good for me because once the interview is done, it's done, it's up. That way I can focus more on creating more various content. I can get back into pumping out episodes of The Vault, which will also be going live with my commentary. I do plan on making some mini documentary style videos, 20, 30 minutes max, which will be full of overlaying photos and video and interviews with people on certain topics. If you want to support this channel and help me create more content, consider becoming a Patreon member. I have a link to my Patreon page in the description below. I also have a link to my PayPal donation page if you want to make a donation to this channel. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, and hit the bell icon to be notified of all new uploads. I have links to my social media in the description below. I have links to my Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Again, thank you so much for watching this interview with Jeremy Baytal. I look forward to seeing you at episode 21 when we start going live on the Dead and Outblading YouTube channel. Take care, and until next time.